Welcome, everybody. We are on the second chapter of Art of War. Let me hand it over to Jason. Jason, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, today is our second uh, week for the Art of War by Sun Zi. Okay. So uh, just a quick overview on the last week, uh, chapter one, we talk about the very, very first step, which is I call it the chapter, the name call it the plan. So basics, Sun Tzu is a theorian. I assume the audience is the prince, the ruler, the head of the state. Theorian, it's like a business plan. Theorian, okay, five things need to be careful about the war. The Tao, the heaven, the earth, the general, and the method. Okay, we have a detailed explanation on that. Then talk about the comparison. And then finally, leads to calculations. So that's the last week we end. You have a plan, then you have to calculate, make more calculation, then you can foretell you are winning. Okay. So today we enter the chapter two. The title is, I translate as, uh, wage the war. Okay, so uh, the, I hope the title is not misleading because at this moment, the war is not started yet. The, they are still talking about war. It's still go or not go. Okay, it's not decided. The decision haven't made yet at this moment. So we will go detail for chapter two, which is relative short. Basics is to tell you what you need to know. He tell you you need to know the evil of war before you can have the benefit of a war. So what's the evil of the war? The money, financial cost. Okay, so you should be ready. Okay, understand this kind of thing. Then you can go, and then we can lead to the chapter three. So then we can start for the chapter uh, two. And any one want to read uh, any translation? Uh, folks, go ahead and uh, volunteer. Let's go. Let's. We're going to start with James. James, go ahead. Followed by Evanique. All right. I have the. Yeah, uh, just just one minute before we start. Start to read. If anyone have any question, does it give about five minutes? You know, if you have a question or any comment in general on this chapter, or if you are new, if you have a question, you are not. Now, so you. Yeah, Folks, if you have questions or comments, go ahead and type exclamation mark in the chat. Um, we're going to start with Srividya. Srividya, go ahead. Hi, um, I am new to the group and I have been interested in reading Art of the War. So today while I was searching for meetups, your group popped up. So I uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, joined the group uh, to read the book together because I heard so much about this book. So I uh, am reading through Project Gutenberg. So I don't have a book with me. It was rather uh, last minute. So is that a good version to go with? I will say any version would be good. And then uh, in this meetup, the special on this meetup is I will make my own translation and then I will explain word by word Okay, I'm not saying that's the best, but I will say that's the closest to the original text and the newest because uh, like the most popular Giles translation is over hundred years old. And his target is probably British, you know, high society. Okay, so it's not us. Okay, and so I think I made the modern translation newest. Okay, so, and uh, the, everyone is also part of my project because your question, your comment, your even your criticism are uh, helping uh, me to do a better job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Sri Vidya. Next up is going to be Amon. Amon, go ahead. Thank you all. I, uh, as I was able to say to some of you, I am in route 
to home. I should be there in 10 minutes and back on camera. And I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, I just wanted to echo what Jason had to say about the art of war and this chapter being about the decision making of war as opposed to the art of battle, which I think is one of the common misconceptions. People assume art of war, they think it means the actual engagement of conflict. And what is emphasized in the Sun Tzu is that deciding whether or not to engage in conflict is one of the most critical decisions a person can undergo, a ruler can make. And part of the reason for emphasizing that was the environment from which he was coming from prior to, where war was made often capriciously for someone's greater glory or honor. You had these warlords who would challenge one another just to rise in society ranks and image, et cetera. And Sun Tzu in part really does an excellent job of explaining the the ground shift that had occurred in their time and that the cost of war are so much more than had what been considered had been considered before and that they needed to be considered systematically and carefully this made him unique and we take for granted in our modern time that warfare would be something engaged in we would hope thoughtfully but that was a new development in the Sun Tzu. And I wanted to put that out there for everyone's consideration and to remind you of what I said at our last meetup, which is although presentism is something that is a concern anytime you read ancient texts, this text allows for it a bit more because in it you will find the makings of early psychology, the makings of early political theory, the makings of early, you know, sociological theories. Um, so don't be too shy about reading it and even rereading it with a new eye or a new angle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amon. Um, all right. Uh, so, folks, uh, uh, so Jason, let's, uh, shall we go with the readings? Yeah, is there, there's no other common comment. Um, okay. yeah. Wonderful. And uh, folks, what we're going to do is if you've got a hard deadline at uh, in two hours, so please keep your comments and uh, questions fairly short. Amon, you can comment as much as you want, you know, Amon and Jason, because you're the ones providing uh, the, the context. Uh, and uh, but for everybody else, keep your comments short in the beginning so that we have enough time after we are done with everything to have a really good discussion. All right, folks. So it's going to be James followed by Evanique for the reading. James. Okay, I have the Lionel Giles translation. Mm -hmm. Waging War, Section One. Sanja said. In the operations of war, where there are the, in the field a thousand swift chariots and many heavy chariots and a hundred thousand mail clad soldiers with provisions enough to carry them a thousand li, the expenditure at home and at the front, including entertainment of guests small items such as glue and paint, and sums spent on chariots and armor will reach the total of 10 of a thousand, 1,000 ounces of silver per day. Such is the cost of raising an army of 100,000 men. Thank you, James. Uh, next up is Evanique. Are we reading the whole chapter or just section one? Just section one. Okay. You have a different translation? Uh, yeah, but I it doesn't say what translation. It just says Sun Tzu on my Kindle. Okay. It doesn't give me who translated it. So apologies. Um, 
So section one, Sun Tzu said, in the operations of war, where there are in the field a thousand swift chariots, as many heavy chariots, and a hundred thousand mail clad chariot soldiers, with provisions enough to carry them a thousand li, the expenditure at home and at the front, including entertainment of guests, small items such as glue and paint, and some spent on chariots and armor, will reach the total of a thousand ounces of silver per day. Such is the cost of raising an army of a hundred thousand men. Okay, thank you. Uh, it it sounds like it's the same translation. That's I kind of find out, unlike Tao Te Ching or in uh, Confucius Anna, there are the many, many different translations. And this one seems, look guys, uh, Giles made a translation 100 years ago and hardly find a new translation. I even bought a book from Amazon and they have a beautiful picture on that. And then when I read the text, actually the author just copied the Giles translation. So uh, if you have a different translation, it will come to read it. But you know, I find out that it's uh, people just copy from the uh, same translation. So I'm going to offer the translation among and I work on this one. And then on chapter two, the title is called Waging War. Okay, I translate the basics by the Chinese name title, even I don't see the title match very well for the contents, but I think that'll, that'll be fine. And I think the very first uh, paragraph, okay, I, I put this two dash one. I think the purpose Sun Zi want to do is shock the ruler, the head of the state, how much the cost Okay, and how important to consider that, okay, before you make a decision whether or not you want to fight this war. So we can read a little bit more rhetorically on this uh, sentence. So that's why I also translate a little bit more uh, uh, rhetorically. Okay. So Master Sun said, it is a general rule of military operation. We need to prepare thousands of Swiss chariot, thousands of heavy, heavy chariot, a hundred thousand foot soldier, and thousands of miles of foot transportation. The expenditure of domestic and foreign affairs, such as payment for the guest and the visitor, supplies like gruels and pens, and the maintenance of the chariot and the armors will cost the thousands of gold daily. Afterward, we can dispatch the army of a thousand, a hundred thousand men. So usually they talk about hundred, during the warring state, we can imagine uh, because of the advance of the technology. So, uh, instead of have the nobleman fighting the war, kind of a gentleman's game. In this time, we can, uh, China can have a mass uh, scale, large scale of war. So 100,000 military is, well, I would not say common, but basics, it's not unusual. So a significant war is can um, uh, 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 have a, a movement of, Hundred thousand people. So Sun Tzu, the first after talking about the plan, Sun Tzu tell the prince, what's the important thing? Think about this, how much does it cost? And remember, talk about, here talk about every day, okay? It's not only how much you have, you have to also think about your cash flow. Okay, so they were going to, the reason talking about this is Sun Tzu going to deed of not only how much money you need to spend, also how long you can sustain in this situation. Okay, thank you. Uh, Amang, you, you are back, that's great. I am back. <laughs> and I didn't have much chance to, uh... Excuse me, my phone is trying to still talk to me and I'm hearing echo. There we go. Yes, I'm back. Um, and I 
agree with what Jason said before. Many of the translations you'll find are reiterations of Guile's version. Um, there are a few other ones out there. I have one here that's by Samuel Griffith, but you'll see the same sort of standard fare when it comes to the art of war because Giles made an excellent translation. That having been said, Jason made a truly excellent translation. Um, I agree with him. This is about impressing the importance, like I said, the real cost of war upon the ruler making them understand that this isn't just you getting dressed in your finery going out on your chariot with a bunch of men behind you for show this will have repercussions that ripple from that front of the battle all the way back into your home base your society and those may not be recuperable if you are not thoughtful about how and why you do this Thank you, Amon. Um, so Jason, we take uh, questions or comments now, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, folks, go ahead and type an exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom if you'd like uh, to uh, ask a question or make a comments. Try to keep your questions and comments brief so that we will have plenty of time afterwards for a general discussion. Uh, it's going to be Madeline followed by James. Madeline. Yes, uh, thank you, Srikant and Jason. Uh, I had noticed in James's translation, uh, it was gold. It was silver instead of gold, and I know China at one point at least had been on a silver currency, and that was a big point of contention with Europe. I was wondering what the original said that it would be translated both as gold or as silver. Uh, the original word is gold. Okay, but I believe uh, when Sun Tzu write gold, he probably means metal. Okay, so, but I, I, I don't bother to because I don't want to get involved to translate the currency from the five thousand uh, two thousand five hundred years ago and the China to U.S. dollars. So I just put the thousand uh, thousands of gold daily. That's the I, I translate. Thank you. Next up is going to be James followed by Quan. James. Uh, yeah, thank you. I love the fact that this seems like a, uh, a modern army in many respects. It has both uh, has swift, swift equipment as well as heavy equipment, uh, like uh, that you have, you have swift tanks and you have um, stable artillery and so forth, heavy artillery that are, are now uh, has to be fairly stable. So you have the, the heavier the heavier chariots, uh, which are slower. You have uh, 100,000 troops. Wow, that's quite an army. So uh, it's like, look out. Uh, so, uh, and this is going to cost a lot of money every day. So this is like just the beginning of realistic war planning strategy. Just make sure that, you know, you, you're, you're, you're planning ahead so that you're not going to run out of money. That glue and paper mache or whatever it is he's talking about is going to cost a lot. Glue and paint, whatever. Yeah, uh, maintenance. Maintenance is going to be expensive. So it's like modern, very much like modern war planning. Yeah. Excellent. You. Thank you. And uh, anytime, Jason or Amon, you want to uh, comment, just go ahead and type exclamation mark privately to me or raise your hand, whichever way you want. Next up is going to be Jason, followed by Quan. Okay, and Quan go first. Okay. Yeah. When sure. I raise the hand, just put me in the order. So. Okay. No, no, Jason, go ahead. Go ahead, Jason. Okay, thank you. I can make a quick comment on the... Uh, 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 personally, I'm impressed by uh, 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 Sun Tzu talking about the payment for the guest and the visitor. Okay, I don't know anybody how how do you think about this? Because during that time when you wage a war, it's they, they have other than the military, they have a lot of you know uh, lobbyist. Okay and the consultant you need to hire you need to send the lobbyist to the foreign country to make a friend or you can do double uh, spy business okay a lot of things like this so this one also in consideration and then i think the description is very vivid yeah thank you that's all i wanted to say 
Thank you, Jason. Next up is Quan, uh, followed by Joe. Quan. Okay, for those who uh, want to have a certain images of how the aristocratic battle happened uh, 26 centuries ago, you can watch the movies by Kurosawa, okay? Because the way the Japanese were fighting in the 16th century resemble a, a lot to the kind of aristocratic battle before the battles became professional in China, okay? Because they would call themselves by their ancestors' names and so on. It was a play for gentlemen, as Jason said, and not professional armies uh, having specific goals. Uh, that's for my short uh, command. The other thing too, is that to show to what extent uh, Sun Wu was in advance in his time because the famous battle of Poju in 506 BCE, uh, was uh, the result of his planning and the, the Wu kingdom for, for, for which he worked, uh, managed to conquer the much bigger Chu kingdom, okay, in 506. And why I said he was incredibly in advance because the famous battle of uh, Changping in 260 BCE, meaning practically 250 years later, was a battle involving 400 thousand people okay so to see the 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 man was truly a visionary uh in term of uh, warfare and my last thing is a question to jason uh, i'm sorry i was not there because i was a little bit late how did you translate the expression chu hao feudal lord what feudal lord feudal lords okay thanks okay. Because I, I was a you little agree bit, or not? Uh, I agree perfectly because I was a little bit uh, insulted by the translation by Giants, who translated Chu Hao by Chief Thames, which is a little bit <laughs> offending for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds like uh, 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 it sounds chief. like uh, <laughs> like uh, like the chief of villagers. It is totally unacceptable. So, Jason, congratulations for upholding the honor of the Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Koan, and thank you, Jason. Next up is going to be Joe followed by Ocean. Joe. Um, thank you, everybody, for their comments. I mean, it's really, this is a lot of fun. Um, so uh, what I actually, when I'm thinking about this, I kind of come back to the five principles that we covered in the first chapter. And the two things that actually stick out for me in particular are the moral law and the commander. And the idea of the moral law in this particular instance is that um, essentially you have the people's uh, loyalty. And so that you have to demonstrate a certain calculation and really thoughtfulness in, before you enter in an engagement, because people have to actually believe that this is worthwhile. So in order to have people, if you want to think about it in modern context, think about it in terms of um, very long drawn out conflicts that even the United States has been in and that how it has lost support over time. So to carefully consider your, your military uh, um, uh, ventures, or uh, for lack of a better term, uh, that you know this is what it's really specifying. Um, as far as the commander goes, it's this also this confidence in that somebody is, uh, we talked about this again in the, in the uh, first chapter, is that they're acting wisely, uh, you know, and not only wisely in the sense that how to, that to engage in conflict, but just wisely in the sense of the allocation of resources themselves. So there are a limited amount of resources, and I think that what they're really yeah, you know, what Sun Tzu is really laying out here is just how high of a cost conflict really is. And as Jason had said, it's almost shocking the way it's presented and that that's an important consideration so that you are very careful before you decide what to do when you're talking about engaging in war. So that's all. Thank you, Joe. So, so let me let me interrupt you know, here a little bit, okay? So personally, I know uh, uh, most of translate translators of moral law, and I disagree because the original word is Tao, okay? So uh, I explained last time, okay? Uh, uh, it's Tao including moral part, but uh, uh, it's not about moral. 
So uh, of course you can read as a moral law, that's, that's fine. But I just want to point out that the text called Tao. And my reading on this text, it's, it's an a moral text, okay? So they, in later on, they, Sun Tzu definitely talk about moral, like, you know, uh, people will die, you know, it's not good. Yeah, but this kind of morality serves the purpose of war. Okay, so that's in this sense. So personally, I read this one as a moral text, just like you teach your kids how to play chess. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Ocean followed by Quan. Ocean. All right, good to join in again. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, so a couple of things, uh, two, two uh, quick things. One is that, um, some people mentioned about how the Japanese uh, fought uh, several hundred years ago, but uh, occurred to me that um, you know, general military generals who you know fought against the United States in, uh, during the World War II didn't read carefully about this particular logistics and how to plan to swift, swiftly end the war instead of prolonging and uh, you know cost a fortune to continue the war. And you know, I, if I remember correctly. So many people were killed in the um, Pacific War between you know Japan, Japan, Japanese and Americans. More than two thirds of the people, soldiers who were killed, it was well, not by the Americans, but by the uh, starvation because the logistics was so poor. They starved and uh, killed by the disease, not by the bomb, or not by killed by the American soldiers. So, so it's very pathetic and sad, you know, if you if you're not carefully planning about the logistics and how to end the war swiftly. So. This is very interesting. I'm glad to hear that. And uh, I, but the other thing is um, maybe Sun Tzu was not familiar with you know the thing that uh, a great president, American president uh, Eisenhower, uh, warned us the the, the merging. Okay, of Ocean, the uh, let's of, do one yeah. thing. Uh, Ocean, let's do one thing. We will discuss this uh, you know after the entire thing is done. Right now we're just going very tightly with with the with the paragraphs themselves. We please bring this point up at the end of the discussion. All right. Oh, okay, no problem. Thank you. Thank you, Ocean. Next up is going to be, I think Amon had a uh, comment and then Quan. Amon. Uh, just very briefly, I wanted to say uh, something to what Ocean said about the uh, cost of war and World War II in the Japanese. Um, there was a great deal of strategy up into the point of bombing Pearl Harbor. That was a risk that they took thinking it wouldn't actually draw America into the war and they were mistaken. Um, the, the logistics of it, it's a whole big thing, but to echo what Quan said, yes, many of the feudal J Japanese and even into World War II were obliquely familiar with the art of war but there was such an honor culture surrounding the samurai identity that many of the lessons of it were simply overshadowed and forgotten. Thank you, Amon. Uh, next up is going to be Quan. Yeah, very quickly, Amon is right. The Japanese thought that in 1940, they were still at the time of the spring and autumn, 27th century before. But that being said, uh, what I wanted to say is about the word Tao. I, I agree with Jason that, that it's more technical than in the sense of spiritual Tao, but there is a tinge of the notion of leadership, okay? Uh, in the sense that uh, you have to be a good leader. If you are a good leader, uh, you must take into account the desire, the emotions, and the aspirations of your people. So maybe there's a drop or two of spirituality in that too. And I stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Kwan. Uh, Jason, do you want to do two and three uh, together? Next, in the interest of time, it's about uh, 8.32, or do you want to do two? No, let's do two and three. Sounds it, good. Yeah, today is short. The text is okay. short. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, all right, folks, uh, who would like to read? Go ahead and raise your hand or type exclamation mark to read. We'll have two readings. Uh, Amon. I don't Okay. 
Yeah, Let's since I have something more. other than the Giles, I thought I would yes. offer a different translation. This is Samuel Griffin. Okay. Um, and this is book two, verse two. When provisions are transported for a thousand li, expenditures at home and in the field, stipends for the entertainment of advisors. Wait a second. Is it, yeah. Um, I'm off. Start from the, um, Sorry, the number is Operation of war, yeah. Yes. Uh, oh, he may talk about waging the war. You know, they may yeah, change. the difference is significant. Give me one moment. Yeah, sometimes they reverse the order. All right, they, they reverse the order. Ah, here the we go. Grammar, grammar would be Got it. in English. Got it, got it, got it. I think when, let's see. Yes. Talking about the weapon become dual. Okay. The Victory is the main weapon. object. Let me make sure I've got this right. Victory is the main object in war. If it is long delayed, weapons are blunted and morale depressed. When mm -hmm. troops attack cities, their strength will be exhausted. When the armies, when the army engages in protracted campaigns, the resources of the state will not suffice. When your weapons are dulled and ardor dampened, your strength exhausted and the treasure spent, neighboring rulers will take advantage of your distress to act. And even though you, will, you have wise counselors, none will be able to lay good plans for your future. <clears throat> Griffith retains a great deal of commentary. And so it's very difficult to sort of- uh, Amal, can you read the the, one more sentence after that? Because that's a very uh, important. Thus, they also, yeah, yeah, one more yeah. sentence. Thus, while we have heard of blundering swiftness in blundering swiftness in war, we have not yet seen a clever operation that was prolonged. Thank you, thank you, Amon. Next up is uh, Joe. Joe, go ahead. Uh, okay, so I'm just reading the translation that's on the website. Uh, when you engage in actual fighting, if victory is long in coming, then men's weapons will grow dull and their ardor will be damp uh, dampened. If you if you lay siege to a town, you will exhaust your strength. Again, if ca the campaign is protracted, the resources of the state will not be equal to the strain. Now, when your weapons are dulled and your ardor damp 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 <laughs> dampened, uh, your strength exhausted and your treasury spent, other chieftains will spring up to take advantage of your extremity. Then no man, however wise, will be able to avert the consequences that must ensue. Thus, though we have heard of stupid and haste in war, cleverness has never been asso seen associated with long delays. There is no instance of a country having benefited from long warfare. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jason, shall, uh, two is enough, right? Okay, perfect. Perfect. Go ahead. Okay, second paragraph. So right now, talk about timing, uh, how long of the war. In the operation of war, if victory is long in coming, the weapons will become dual and uh, the morale, morale will be subdued. When besieging, you will exhaust all strength. When the military is deployed for a long time, the usefulness of the state will be insufficient. Thus, when your weapons are dual, morale, morale is subdued, strength is exhausted, and the money is spent entirely. Other feudal laws, that's the, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the chieftain, okay, so I think feudal laws make more sense, will arise at this disadvantageous situation. Then there are no wise men who are capable to improve this situ uh, this consequence. So pay attention on this because during that time, China had many, many states, okay? So when you are, your war lasts longer, right? Other feudal laws, you know, before they were neutral, 
And when they see the situ this opportunity, they will try to do something. And uh, Sun Zi is warning the head of state, and it's this time, nobody can save you, your country, because everybody try to take advantage of you. And I asked Armand to read the last sentence because I find out the last sentence, uh, this one, Bing Gu Bing Wen Zuo Su Wei Du Chiao Zi Jiu Yi. It's very difficult to translate. And I hope everyone uh, read this one and then let me know uh, whether or not you understand uh, this in English because I think it's very difficult. So, therefore, our military strategy, we have heard of one's clumsiness in speed, but never seen one's ingeniousness in protraction. It is never a case that a state benefited from protracted war. Okay. So this sentence, I, it's talking about, we have heard, so that means it actually happened. People even in clumsiness, they still try to speed up to finish, but no like a smart man, genius guy, try to prolong the war. I think that's the, uh, the, the, the assumptions uh, try to tell, but I hope I translate it in the uh, right way and it's clear, you know, without further explanation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Amon. Thank you. Uh, Amon, go ahead. I did want to say that what Jason just said about the surrounding states presenting a uh, threat to someone also goes back to explain the expenditure of entertaining guests that was in the previous verse. One of the reasons you would need to be buddy-buddying, showing and, and doing diplomacy as it were with the neighbors is so that they didn't decide to get on the side of the person you were at war with to just gang up on you and destroy you, which was par for the course pretty much during that time. And I do want to say also that Jason's correct. That last sentence is difficult to translate, but I think that what came out here is a good translation that makes clear what's meant, that haste into war can, can be clumsy, but no one's ever accused of genius for protracting warfare. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Aman. Uh, folks, go ahead and type an exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom if you would like to make brief comments or ask brief questions. Uh, next up is going to be Peter. Peter, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Hello. Uh, good, good to be back, Jason. Uh, so I, my, my little question, I guess, it, it's a very good question for, you know, anyone. Uh, so, so, so something that Jason read, uh, no, no nation has benefited from war uh, of attrition, right? Or of attrition or protracted war. Uh, I was wondering if, if this is really an absolute statement or is this usually true? And the reason I ask is because the, the longest war in recent history by any nation is uh, American war in the Middle East, which lasted, in, I think, exactly 19 years and 11 months, so almost two decades. And I highly doubt the USA didn't gain anything from a, such a protracted war. So uh, what do you guys think? Yeah, I would say this, this one probably a good discussion to the end, okay? And then I, I want to back to the translation I make, okay? Uh, the original text, okay? It does say the country, right? Uh, 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 it's never a case that a state, okay, I translate by word, I'm not saying anybody, I say a state, a, a state benefit. So that's a good way to, uh, we can discuss later, okay, who benefit, does a state benefit on that? Wonderful. Uh, so folks, uh, all these general questions about application of these ideas to present times or other times, we'll, we'll keep that for, for the end. Uh, next up is going to be, uh, Amon, would you like to comment on this? 
just very briefly, I wanted to say, I think the argument Sun Tzu is making is that in the aggregate, no state benefits. Not to say that there can be no benefits, but the cost will always outweigh the benefits in a protracted in endeavor. Thank you, Amon. Next up is going to be James, Ocean, and Joe. James. Yeah, I think, uh, well, I was, I was gonna, I was gonna comment on, um, just briefly on uh, the, uh, the Vietnamese war. It was called a protracted war. Uh, the, uh, the, let, the let's keep okay. Vietnamese war. Right. Let, let's keep even, Vietnam even war for the end. Okay. We will, we will yeah. deal with all wars. All right. Uh, so I just like deal the with all wars all together sure. in one fell stroke. Okay. Uh, <laughs> next okay. up. Go no, ahead. no, I was going to add another comment. Um, Please. That this is about, I mean, this is clearly about uh, the uh, the expenditure, like sort of blow, blowing. Uh, uh, in other words, you 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 can't keep your sword sword sharp. You can't keep your uh, you can't keep your uh, strength up indefinitely, or it's going to be a big. Uh, Sub logistics are going to be a big big problem, and uh, morale is going to diminish and. Uh, so the, these are these are all bad situations. Uh, there are going to be uh, counter tendencies that will arise that you didn't expect that mm. uh, are going to impair your military uh, efforts and strategies. Mm. So speed is uh, in accomplishing your goals is is extremely important and not running out of money and uh, not. Uh, uh, making and, and for all these different reasons for the ma maintain maintenance. Uh, 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 morale and um, uh, the economy, both in the field and at home. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And uh, folks, I mean, the, the real value of keeping all of these applications at the end is for us to really commune with the text itself first, because it's very easy to kind of get caught up in the things that we normally think about. But this is a really fundamental way of looking at warfare. And by communing with the text for a period of time, we get how he's approaching it without mixing it up with uh, you know, the common applications. And we can keep all the applications at the end after we have grasped everything. So I think that is a good way of really getting to know this text better. Uh, thank you. Next up is going to be Ocean followed by uh, Joe. Ocean. In, in, can you hear me? Yes. OK, well, in response to a couple of people who mentioned about prolonging the war, it's one word, military industrial complex. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is Joe. So I'll be very brief, because I think everybody's really captured the essence of what we're talking about, the idea that prolonged war is not beneficial to anyone. But I think one important underlying uh, thing to consider here is this idea of, of knowing yourself, knowing your own state's capabilities in this process. Because if you don't understand yourself, you really don't understand how long the war will actually take, or you don't understand your enemy. So I think that there is this, this, uh, this basic understanding of your own capabilities in order to, under, to, to make the determination, hey, this will be quick. Uh, and if you make if you miscalculate that and it is prolonged, that'll it'll end badly for you. Um, and that also requires a knowledge of certain degree of knowledge of your enemy as well. Thank you. Next up is James. Uh, go ahead, James. Uh, you can unmute. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I like where he says you're not going to find anyone smart, no, no wise men that are going to solve these problems for you. That, that's a great, that's a great touch. That's exactly, that's usually 100% true. Thank you. All right, uh, shall we go to uh, number three? Okay, uh, who'd like to read? Go ahead and type an exclamation mark. People who have not read before will get a priority. So, uh, or you can raise your hand in Zoom. Uh, we're going to start with James, James, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, section three. Um, ouch! Just a, just a second while I switch texts. Okay, section three: waging war. The uh, Lionel Giles translation. 
It is only war. It is only one who is thoroughly acquainted with the evils of war that can thoroughly understand the profitable way of carrying it on. The skillful soldier does not raise a second levy, neither are his supply wagons loaded more than twice. Bring war material with you from home, but forage on the enemy. Thus, the enemy, the army, excuse me, thus the army will have food enough for its needs. Poverty of the state exchequer causes an army to be maintained by contributions from a distance. Contributing to maintain an army at a distance causes the people to be impoverished. On the other hand, the proximity of an army causes prices to go up and high prices cause the people's substance to be drained away. When their substance is drained away, the peasantry will be afflicted by heavy exactions. With this loss of substance and exhaustion of strength, the homes of the people will be stripped bare and three tenths of their income will be dis dissipated. While government expenses for broken chariots, worn out horses, breastplates and helmets, bows and arrows, spears and shields, protective mantles, draft oxen and heavy wagons will amount to four tenths of its total revenue. Thank you, James. Next up is Joe. Joe, go ahead. Um, I have the same exact translation, unfortunately. That's what I mean, that, that's... Okay, uh, uh, Jason, uh, do you want to, uh, do you want Amon to read the other translation? Amon, go ahead. I'll take a crack at it. The Griffith translation. Oh. The, uh, thus, those unable to understand the dangers inherent in employing troops are equally unable to understand the advantageous ways of doing so. Those adept in waging war do not require a second levy of conscripts, nor more than one provisioning. They carry equipment from the homeland. They rely, they relay, they rely for provisions on the enemy. <clears throat> Thus, the enemy is plentiful, plentifully provided with food. When a country is impoverished by military operations, it is due to distance transportation carriage of supplies for great carriage of supplies for great distances renders the people destitute where the army is prices are high when prices rise the wealth of the people is exhausted when wealth is exhausted the peasantry will be afflicted with urgent ex exact excitation with the with strength thus depleted and wealth consumed, the households in the central plains will be utterly impoverished and seven tenths of their wealth dissipated. Thank you, Jason. Okay, that's another paragraph, uh, similar oh. to the very first one, right? They try to impress the head of the state the evil of the military op operation. So at the beginning, he talked, if you don't know the evil of military operation, then you cannot fully understand the benefit of the military operation. So you need to know the downside first. So it's another long paragraph, even provide a number, okay? 70%, 60%, this kind of number, okay? to tell the head of state, if you don't manage well, that's the situation we are going to face. So therefore, if one cannot fully understand the evil of military operation, then he cannot fully understand how to benefit from a military operation. Those who are good in military operation know that people cannot be drafted twice. Provisions cannot be loaded three times. 
Warm materials are brought from home, provisions are consumed from the enemy. Thus, the military will have enough food. So here talking about the general rule. So before Sun Tzu talk about the evil, he talk about in general, the good operation is like this, right? People don't be drafted twice. You don't want to be drafted to the war and then come back then again, right? You don't want to do that, okay? People will hate it. And another economical reason is who is going to farm the land, okay? So that's another important issue, right? Second thing, talk about the provision cannot be loaded three times. In general, you load it two times, right? You load the provision when you go into the war. And when you finish the war, you come back, you need provision to come back. So that's why if you do it three times, then you go there and come back, then you do it again, that's the problem. So if you go, then you finish it. You don't go and come back and go. Okay, so that's what he is talking about. And he's talking about, remember, the provision provide only in route. Okay, when during the war, he talking about you should, uh, provision are consumed from the enemy. Okay, so you, prepare the food to bring you to the battlefield. Then during the battle, you consume the food from the enemy, all right? So that's the good thing. Then he's going to talk about if you don't do well, that's the damage to your state. The impoverishment of the state is caused by the long distance military supply. Long distance supply impoverishes people. Those who live close to the army suffer high prices. High prices drain away people's supply. When the money is drained away, the peasant will immediately be afflicted by heavy laboring services. The forces will be subdued. Money will be drained away and the center of homeland will become a vacuum. 70% of people's income will be taken away. 60% of government money will be used for broken chariot, worn out horses, armors, bows, arrows, spears, and shirt mantles and oxen and wagons for transportation. So uh, Sun Tzu almost list all the possible costs on that. And even give you number, 70% of the people's income will be gone. 60% of government money was spent on this kind of fixing the broken material. Okay, so uh, don't ask me why, how does Sun Tzu calculate 70% and 60%? That's, he said that. So uh, I think it's, to me, my experience, very un unusual in ancient Chinese texts. Usually ancient Chinese text doesn't provide this kind of detail, but uh, Sun Tzu provide this kind of detail. So that's the, also the interesting part. Yeah, thank you, uh, Amar. I'm being inundated with old jokes because this one immediately made me think of 80% of all statistics are made up on the spot. Um, <laughs> however, it works. Here it works as a rhetorical device um, because the question anyone would have to ask in the court or ask at the time is who's there to argue with him? Who is Who has a better bead on this than the master who has in, seen and engaged in war in multiple, multiple fields, multiple times. If he says 70%, take it as 70%. And the interesting thing there is, I don't think it's a hard and fast number, the way that it would be in a modern sort of socioeconomical analysis. Well, can we get it down to 68? Are we floating at 68.39? Uh, how is How are the numbers fluctuating? is greater point these things cost you and this is fascinating because it's probably 
the first mention of logistical supply train that I've ever seen committed anywhere in, in any sort of text where he makes the point. The extended supply chain is a incredible danger and and uh, drag, not just on your military, but on everyone. Um, and that little line, provisions are consumed from the enemy. This is the first instance of guerrilla warfare, of the idea of supply yourself from your enemy. Learn to take what they have. And I believe it'll say later more on this and why it is of such great value, more than simply having enough supplies loaded up on your wagons. I really appreciate Jason's analysis of not being able to load your wagons three times, because if you do the math, and if you've loaded three times, then you didn't make it home for number four. <laughs> and so it's not possible to load it three times successfully. It's either two at best or four at worst if you survived. If it's three, no one's left to tell the tale. Thank you. Thank you, Amon. Next up is going to be Supa, Kwan, Evanique. Joe and Allison. Suba, go ahead. Yeah, I would make it quick. Actually, I think between Am Amon and Jason answered my question. I was going there. What the specificity of those numbers, as well as their arbitrariness, we know that those really cannot be any anything based off of a mathematical calculation. Or were they? That was the question. Does anybody have a, a, a hint to think that there was actually some some calculations that were went into those numbers? Or do, can we venture to guess? I, I believe we probably from the experienced uh, uh, general or advisor, point, uh, state advisor's point of view, you know, is that uh, a general idea, probably that's the end. And then you may be more surprised. And in the next paragraph, he's going to talk about 20 times. Then you may ask me, how do you know it's 20 times? <laughs> well, I was going to say, but you were what you said about the loading of the equipment three times, I was trying to see if there's a connection between that and then this depletion of the resources from the rest of the town, but it doesn't sound like it. Okay, thank you. I appreciate your input. That's all. Thank you, Subha. Next up is going to be Kwan, Evelyn, uh, 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 Kwan followed by Evanique. Kwan. Okay, maybe 20 seconds to give an a tentative answer to Suba. Uh, let's not forget that uh, Sunzu uh, came from the principality of Qi, and that principality is a very rich principality and having, I would say, some accounting methods. So it's not impossible that uh, there is a certain reality in uh, accounting uh, methods reflecting here, okay? But it's still a hypothesis. Uh, my main comment is that if there is someone or a group which benefited a lot from that paragraph is the noble house of Jing. The noble house of Jing is the group of aristocrats at the head of the principality of Qin who created the first Chinese empire in 221 BCE. And it was a national and family endeavor starting in 361 BCE, okay? So 361 BCE to 221 BCE is 140 years to show to what extent they have a continuity in their endeavor in terms of transgenerational uh, project. Uh, first, they improve the administration. They improve the irrigation of their land. They improve the weapon making. They improve the organization of the army. And even at the last generation, meaning the generation of the king who will become the first emperor, meaning King Chang, they even managed to extend the, ter the territory which was irrigated by about 50,000 square kilometers to ensure that they wouldn't have enough food before engaging into the massive campaign for conquering all the Chinese lands 
And that campaign will last from 230 BCE to 221 BCE. So they were perfectly aware that the conquest of the, all of the Chinese lands will take about a decade. Just to tell you that when you have a relentless and organized group of leaders, uh, nothing is impossible. Thank you. Thank you, Kwan. Uh, next up is going to be Evanique. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, Jason, when you were talking, um, you talked about, you know, you have, like, when you go to war, you have to know the evil. Um, and then you also talked about, um, you have to know the evil and you have to I, I guess it's not know that you're going to do well, but you, you have to plan to do well or, you know, it's going to result in impoverishment. And I just wanted to make sure um, I understood that correctly because, you know, I think what what is being said is that when you're thinking about waging war, know, like knowing and accepting the evil that's going to come from it. Um, and then, you know, making sure that if you're going to make this decision to do work that you're playing that you're well planned out so that it goes well um so i just wanted to make sure i had that correct um, yeah thank you Evany. you know i think the translation i make i have to admit um the words i translate as evil uh probably not right okay uh, because the evil sometimes implies the moral sense. So I think the right word and the Chinese, I, I, I double check the Chinese word is high. That means damage, that means disadvantage. So it has no moral sense. The words has no moral sense. They have the utilitarian sense. So uh, I think I'm going to change the translation. It should not be evil. Okay, so that means when you go in out to buy the go to the invest in the stock market, okay, the, then I need to tell you, okay, you need to know how much you may lose before you think about how much you can make. I think that's this kind of sense. And uh, uh, since I'm talking, and then uh, I really appreciate uh, 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 Quan talk about the mentioned about Sunzi is coming from the state of Qi. Qi is the very close to Confucius' uh, hometown. And it's because if you look at the map, it's in today's Shandong, which in the east, they close to ocean. Most of China is inland, but this is the ocean. In the ocean, you can not do in the trade with Japan, no, that's not that time, but they can have salt and they can sell salt and they make a lot of money. So Qi at this state is a very rich state. So it's almost like they live a good life. So you can understand, and they are not from farming, right? They do sell, they sell salt, they trade. So they are their accounting idea would be much advanced than other state. And I also see a comment on uh, I don't know who asked in the chat talking about how do I know uh, why the price uh, close to the military will become high. Uh, I think the, what the text said just to say that if you close to the military the price become high. Okay, I think the reason is military, the government try to take the resources, okay, food, everything. I think uh, same situation, my, uh, I grew up in Taiwan. My mom was a young kid. She told me uh, they have no, the, the, the price of rice become very high because the war. And luckily my grandpa, is in the rice selling business, so they don't suffer. So that's the story, you know. Thank you, thank you, Jason. Next up is going to be Allison, Joe, and Quan. Allison. Um, so this is the second time I've read this, and I find that what I think is really interesting about this is that it's not just a book about the art of war, but it's really about the art of management. 
because I feel like anytime you're managing any group of people in literally any situation, you need to follow everything in this book. Um, and this particular passage is that you have to plan for every single solitary thing that could go wrong and have contingency plans for all of them. And that when they're all in place, then everything runs smoothly. Um, but you know, you can think of like anywhere in the world where things run smoothly, they've thought of everything that can go wrong and there's a plan for it. And places where things are really chaotic and it's not run, a business that's not run well, it's because they're not thinking 20 steps ahead. They're just thinking, all right, what are we doing this week? But the people who are thinking next week, the week after, the week after next year, then it runs smoothly. So it's it's just a brilliant book, it really is. Thank you, Alison. Great point. Uh, next up is going to be uh, Joe, followed by Quan and Ocean. Joe. Yeah, I think just to build on really quickly that point, um, I think it it would be, uh, you know, if we have time after we, we have the discussion about like how this applies outside of war. I think that that's one of the most important things about reading the art of war. Um, but just coming back to it, I think it's uh, important. And I keep coming back to the five principles. I call them principles that were actually stated in the outset in chapter one. Uh, and one of those were was Earth. And so that's understanding the terrain, understanding the distance, understanding the logistics, and it kind of falls underneath that. So it, I think if we keep looking at those five principles that we'll find some in line of reasoning that actually uh, that relates to many of these points. Uh, the second point that I would just make really quickly is, you know, this is fascinating to see that this is the guns are butter argument you know, thousands of years ago. So where the, whether you're going to have an opportunity cost of going to war and your opportunity cost is going to be food, it is going to be the resources at home and it will cost you dearly. So therefore be very careful in your judgment and make sure that the costs outweigh the benefits in order to make that decision. And those are the same decisions that we make today. We don't necessarily see them. It's not transparent all the time, and that's a problem. But that's what's being warned here, is that every decision that you make, there are value trade-offs, and that you better analyze those value trade-offs in order to, when, when, before, before making any haste decisions. Uh, thank you, Joe. Joe, could you put those five principles in, in the chat for everybody, uh, everybody's convenience? Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Quan followed by Ocean. Quan. Okay, uh, Jason, I have a suggestion. I have a suggestion for you for high, maybe calamities of war. What do you think? Okay, let me, thank you. Let me think about it. Yeah, I, I'm looking for. I think a calamity probably more. Yeah, that makes sense. But I think that yeah. That's yeah. Thank you, Milan. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Ocean. Uh, anyway, it's possibility. Uh, I, I was thinking. Uh, Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Great. Okay. Yeah. I'm so I'm so delighted and honored to uh, join this group. Um, it consists of. A lot of intelligent, knowledgeable people, and some people are apparently very familiar with the uh, recent Japanese war and uh, you know ancient Japanese wars. And uh, you know uh, this particular let, portion. Let's put all the wars together, um, Ocean. Yeah, but the, but this particular chapter of the warning of the uh, the distant war is uh, uh, take a look at the most recent history, uh, the Pacific War. You know, fighting Japanese to fight yeah. the, we'll the, the that, island we'll... in Hawaii. That's 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 the, the a good example of not how not to fight a war according to very some, good. Some, uh, some Ocean, we will take that up. We'll take that up once we are done with all the things. What what we're doing, folks, is that we're going systematically. We're going to first focus on the text itself, try to understand what is being said there, and then after we are done with the chapter, we're going to apply it to anything that we want to apply. To thank you. Absolutely, uh, absolutely, absolutely. I'm just still trying to say in relation to this what the chapter this says. But thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. We'll, we'll bring you, you can bring all of these points up as soon as we finish discussing the chapter itself. 
Thank you. Um, all right, let's go to, I think we've covered everybody. Uh, okay, let's go to four. Who would like to read? Go ahead and type an exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom. Does anybody have any translation uh, apart from Amon? Does anybody have any translation other than the standard translation? Uh, if you if you can, uh, just uh, let uh, let us let us know. We're going uh, to start. Go ahead. Does someone have the the Roger Ames translation? Okay, go ahead, Kwan. I do. Uh, go I do. go first. With, go first with Jason translation, and I wouldn't go. I wouldn't come after. No, Jason is going to be the last one, but uh, ah, okay, 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 okay. But I, I have to open it first. <laughs> so, okay. So then we will go with uh, Joe first. Joe, go ahead. Sure. Um, Hence, a wise general makes a point of forging on the enemy. One cartload of the enemy's provisions is equivalent to twenty of one's own, and likewise, a single uh, pickle of his own pr provender is equivalent to 20 from one's own store. Now, in order to kill the enemy, our men must be roused to anger, that there may be advantage from defeating the enemy. They must have their rewards. Therefore, in chariot fighting, when 10 or more chariots have been taken, those should be rewarded who took the first. Our own flag should be submitted for those of the enemy and the chariots mingled and used in conjunction with ours. The chapter uh, captured soldiers should be kindly treated and kept. This is called using the conquered foe to augment one's own strength. Thank you, Joe. Next up is Quan. Okay, so that's the 1993 translation by Professor Rogers T. Ames. Therefore, the wise commander does his best to feed his army from enemy soil. To consume one measure of the enemy's provisions is equal to 20 of our own. To use up one bale of the enemy's father is equal to 20 of our own. Killing the enemy is a matter of arousing the anger of our man. Snatching the enemy's wealth is a matter of dispensing the spoils. Thus, in a chariot battle, where more than 10 war chariots have been captured, reward those who capture the first one and replace the enemy's flags and standards with our own. Mix the chariots in with our ranks and send them back into battle, provide for the captured soldiers and treat them well. It is called increasing our own strength in the process of defeating the army. Thank you, Jason. Okay, here, uh, let me see. Hence, a wise general has to consume provisions from the enemy. One bag of food consumed from, enemy, from the enemy is equivalent to 20 of our own. One carload of hay consumed from the enemy is equivalent to 20 of our own. Uh, I need to some uh, explanation on that. First is one to 20. Of course, I don't know how uh, uh, Sun Tzu get this number. Uh, I believe probably his experience, prima facie okay, uh, uh, data. So he got one to 20 ratio because you, and let's think about it as reasonable, right? You consume, then not only you gain, and you also cause the damage for your enemy. I think that's right. And one thing, I think one thing I like to to, uh, to explain is he talk about two units, one called Zhong, one called uh, Dan. Okay, so I didn't translate the unit, but I believe Zhong is kind of like a jar. So I believe that's the one is talking about human food because you probably eat a jar this size of food every day, I think, okay? And the tan is much bigger, it's the huge. So I believe that probably the hay for the, uh, for the uh, animal, okay? I, I think so it's a small 
small unit and the large unit. I believe the uh, the they are they 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 use pick these two unit because one imply the human foot and another imply the animal foot. Okay, that's my assumption. Okay, so second part. Um, Soldiers kill the enemy for their anger. They take the enemy's good for their reward. Therefore, in the chariot fighting, when 10 or more chariots are captured, reward those who first captured the chariot. Charge, uh, change the flags and mix the captured chariot with ours and treat the captured soldier well. This is called defending, uh, defeating the enemy to augment our strength. So uh, instead of focus on uh, reward and the punishment, or uh, this kind of human psychology, I think another important message here is when you fight in a war, you need to remember during the fighting, you need to find a chance to increase yourself. You are not keep fighting and you yourself become weaker and weaker, poor and poor. You want to become stronger and stronger during the process of fighting. So you need to uh, uh, consume the, the, the provisions from uh, uh, enemies. You need to recruit okay, the soldier for the enemy. You need to capture uh, enemies chariot to use for your own. So you will keep you just like good example would be Alexander the Great, right? He only take, I don't know how many, a few hundred and he can conquer half the world because he kept recruiting, you know, the uh, enemies. And then that's that's the way, you know, uh, Amma, thank you. Thank you. Um, I like this chapter. <laughs> I, I really like this chapter because it gets into some very fundamentals of warfare and battle specific because here we're talking about if the battles commence, then you've got your own provisions, so does your enemy. Use your enemy's provisions as often as possible is going to be a motive for the general. It's not going to be motive for your soldiers. They're going to be motivated by their rage towards the enemy or their avarice to gain the spoils of warfare. And between those two, he leans towards the avarice. He says, reward them, give them those goods, make sure you don't just let them have it re-outfit it, make it your own, make it look like yours, but give it to the soldiers so that they have incentive. This gets into the incentivizing people. What works better, the carrot or the stick? And he's saying the carrot. The carrot works better every time, but make it a carrot of your standards and then make that, that soldier, in a very roundabout way, he's saying make the enemy's soldiers, your soldiers, their equipment and their personnel. If you can do that, you are augmenting your strength much more than you are simply by killing one after another after another. Wonderful report. Thank you. Thank you, Amon. Um, next up, uh, folks, go ahead and type an exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom in order to ask questions or make brief comments. Uh, next up is going to be Srividya. Srividya, go ahead. Yes, I think I am looking at the Project Gutenberg uh, version, which says, in, now in order to kill the enemy, our man must be roused to anger. And so I think, uh, you know, uh, Amon kind of answered the question because I was thinking that men need to be angry and also re rewarded, right? And so uh, angry enough to go attack the enemy. And uh, then also you, you have the incentive for uh, rewards, which keeps them going. Uh, but Amon, I'm understanding that uh, you're also 
In this, they're also recruiting the enemy soldiers and therefore anger is no longer in the equation. Am I getting that right? I would suggest that it is at least intimated in the text that otherwise, what cause would he have to say, treat the, the captured enemies well? The more that you can make your enemy your own resource, the better you are. Uh, Jason, would you like to add anything? Yeah, let, let me continue on what I, yeah, I think that's, a, that I, when I do translation, I also struggle on this, uh, on this about the reward, uh, the angry and the reward, because if you look at Chinese, basically you talk about those who kill enemy, angry, okay, those who take the uh, benefit, okay, from the enemy, good stuff, okay? So it doesn't tell you, okay, it's to arouse their anger or reward them, we just induce, okay, the, by the text. So I try to be neutral, okay, in my translation. That's why I say, I just pick a very neutral word. So you kill the enemy for their anger. So I don't want, over explain because the general one to reward and to arouse their anger so that that's the purpose i'm doing but that's really up to you how you want to uh, understand the text thank you uh next up is going to be ocean ocean go ahead yeah can you hear me yes it is summarized in this way i think the abraham lincoln read the sun too he said if you don't kill your enemies, if you can make your enemy your friend, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ocean. Uh, next up is going to be Quan, James, Joe, and Laura. Quan. Okay, once again, I want to make some propaganda for the noble house of Jing, having created the first Chinese empire in 221 BCE, because uh, they created a, an, an organization of nobility involving all their people, okay? So everyone was born ordinary. The exception that if you were born in a regular noble family, you start at the rank eight. But if you're born a commoner, you start at rank one. And each time there's something in, the, in war, in famine, or problems in the state, if you contribute to the state, you can advance by one, two, three ranks, etc. Okay, and it, it's a system of 20 ranks. So the, the top is 20. Uh, the prime minister is uh, at 19 or 20. Okay, so uh, the, that's the notion of reward and punishment. Okay, and I want to say that what is called legalism, fa, and that I would suggest to translate by principles and practices of administration and statecraft is is deal with in this in this uh, chapter or uh, this uh, paragraph okay because uh, uh, once again confucianism is at the core of personal and family epistemological development of personal growth but the regulation of the state of the society it's really legalism and we are at the core of legalism here and especially in the activity that is the most uh, uh, and compassing in human activities, okay? Because I remember Alison said maybe 10 minutes ago that it's more than a, a manual on warfare, but on manual on management. I beg to differ a little bit with Alison, even if I think that her command is awesome. War is the highest activity of human beings, okay? Highest, not in the sense of the noblest, but it's the activity requiring an absolute cohesiveness and organization within any society. Uh, in that sense, I call war or warfare the highest human activity. So when you are talking about warfare, you are talking about the most difficult management that can be given to a human being. So uh, I stop here. Thank you, Kwan. Uh, next up is going to be James followed by Joe and Laura. James. Thank you. Yeah, I noticed I really like this, um, uh, the idea of uh, angry soldiers. 
uh, this is uh, emotion is so important in humans and uh, uh, the uh, the even even such uh, negative emotions as anger and you want your soldiers to be killers so they have to be motivated i'm sorry so this is uh, this is uh, brilliant uh, the the soldier has to be angry or he's not going to get his rewards uh, perfect thank you uh, next up is joe followed by laura joe Um, yeah, I'm just going to focus on one uh, particular thing: is that the the idea of actually not uh, focusing on on punishing the enemy, and actually the reason why I say that is that uh, if you're looking for a kind of long term stability and no kind of uprising subsequent to the battle itself, uh, therefore you ought to be treating your enemy with a certain level of respect. And so therefore, you know, that helps end the war so that you're not necessarily uh, engaged in constant conflict. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a more just way, I would say, as, oppo as opposed to uh, looking at this from a vengeful approach, which is kind of never, it's a kind of a cyclical thing where you, you're, you're, it's never ending. So in order to prevent war, you have to, uh, act more humanely. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Next up is Laura, followed by Peter. Laura, go ahead. Uh, Laura? Laura, you need to unmute. I think she's frozen. OK, uh, let's go with Pete. Uh, let me see. Laura, can you unmute? Okay, um, let me go with Peter and then uh, I'll come to you. Um, Peter, go ahead. Oh, can you hear me? Hello? Uh, it's very low. Can you speak into the uh, mic? Uh, Peter, can't hear you, can't hear you. Okay, can't hear you. All right, um, okay, so then let's go to the next, next uh, last session. And uh, folks, um, all the questions that we have deferred, please is, is bring them up. Yeah, Hello? this is better. Go ahead, Peter. Okay, sorry, my, my Bluetooth having trouble. Okay, I just want to say, um, I, I I agree with actually Joseph's point. I think I think that was Joseph. I, I can't see his face. I'm driving, but it sounds like him. So what what he just said, um, I would say, is very true, uh, especially uh, what do you call it, major battles. Uh, like on a world scale and 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 i think a lot of us already know this so i'm not going to go too much into it but i just want to say that the the end of world war one the treaty of versailles pretty much guaranteed the second world war so that that's pretty much to joseph's point thank you thank you thank you peter and please do not look at the look at uh look look at our faces just focus on the on the road uh thank you um next uh, we're going to go to number five. Uh, okay, wait a minute, Laura, you have unmuted. Can you go yeah, ahead? No, go ahead. No, I just, I read it um, with a fascination. Uh, I was amazed at the pragmaticness of it and the use of the statistical kind of approach, I think was real. I think people do count very much on that. They, it's not absolute, but it gives them a, a, a range in which to think about deployment and so forth, and the money that it's gonna cost. But I was fascinated. The systematic pragmatic approach was really impressive. But I also thought about it as I read about it, our entry into Vietnam and the current situation. That, in that, one, that one we will deal with as soon as we're done with the main one. So all applications we are doing afterwards. Oh, right, all right. Thank all right. you. Uh, thank you, Laura. I just wanna make one comment. I really liked Amon's comment about uh, the approach of the enemy soldier, because if you can make enemy soldiers want to join you, then actually the effect of that 20 factor is real, because it's like saying that all their commanders have to worry about, oh, are our people going to leave and join this other guy, you know, our opposite. Uh, so I, that was a great comment. Uh, next up is going to be Sebastian. Sebastian, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, it's to Jason. Jason, is, is 
this passage trying to make us aware that in any war, a there's a mental and then a physical aspect. And is are they equal? Or um, because that's very important. I mean, you can't statistically say 70% or 80% of the mental issue. Um, I'd like to know your comment. Okay, yeah. Uh, I don't know, be honest. You know, I don't know. You just say 20, 20 times. And uh, uh, to me, I, I really appreciate, okay, Sun Tzu put 20 on that because I think it's a prima facie, okay, and that's including mental damage. I I think you know, but I'm not expert on that. Thank you, uh, Quan. I would like to to give a a, a practical example uh, about the psychological dimension of warfare. Okay. Uh, Amon mentioned the fact that if you can gain the respect of the, your, your enemy, the soldiers who would come to your side, it's already something. But let's not forget, it's on, not only the soldiers. The, principal, the, the kingdom of Han has been uh, conquered first in 230 BCE by the Qin Principality. And that small kingdom was just to the east of the Qin Principality. And when the Qin Principality opened 50,000 square kilometers of land by new irrigation, they invited the peasants of the other kingdoms to come to their land to cultivate that land. Okay, So the Han Kingdom was already conquered even before the first chariot went out of the Qin kingdom because the peasant population went down by at least one third, okay? And that is true psychological warfare. And it's very at the center of the Sun Tzu or of the military Chinese thought. You have to win even before the first battle. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kwan. All right, let's go to our final section. Um, who would like to read? Uh, it's going to be uh, anybody who wants to read one can go and then we can go. With, uh, we'll start with James and then either Quan or Amon, whoever wants to go second. Um, James. Uh, James, can you go ahead and unmute? I'm sorry. In war, then, let your great object be victory, not lengthy campaigns. Thus, it may be known that the leader of armies is the arbiter of people's fate, the man on whom it depends whether the nation shall be at peace or in peril. Thank you. Uh, who, uh, Quan or Amon? Okay, Amon sent me a Amon sent me a message inviting me to read, so I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't comply to his invitation. Uh, so hence, in war, prize the quick victory, not the protracted engagement. Thus, the commander who understands war is the final arbiter of people's lives and lord over the security of the state. Thank you, Jason. Okay, I think the, that's uh, probably all the same. Uh, it's not difficult. <clears throat> Thus, the value of warfare is in victory, not in duration. Therefore, we know that the general of the army is the arbiter of people's fate and the master of national security. Uh, actually, the word is anwe, safety and uh, danger. So I think it, that means. And then in chapter six, he's talking about actually the good general is the arbiter of the enemy's fate, not only in your people's fate, also your enemy's fate. So we can conclude uh, for Today's section, okay, let me give some thought on this because 
you can see uh, at the beginning, you talk about the plan, okay, in business, that's our business plan. This chapter is a financial forecast. The, when you run a business, you need to have a PNL for five years forecast. That's what it's talking about. And the next chapter, next week, uh, the name is strategy, okay? So that's our marketing plan, okay? How are you? So not going to the war yet. We still planning, okay? Right now talking about money, you sh the goal is finish as soon as possible, not that long time. And the, that's important. And the next week we talk about uh, the strategy. And I think Joe already foretell the important message for the next week, know thyself. And, and you also know your enemy. That's the key, okay? So uh, that's the, uh, I think, yeah. And another thing is five principle. We talk about a lot, okay? So last time, last week we have, uh, uh, we don't have a lot of time. So I like to talk about this one. Personally, I think this one is important. Talk about Tao, the heaven, the uh, earth, the general, and the method. So basics, if you think about in business, right? If you write a business plan, it will start from the mission statement, which, you know, a little bit moral sense, but it's not, you know, uh, totally much more than moral, okay? So your mission statement, heaven is your timing. When you are entering, why you are entering the market now, okay? And uh, the earth, which is your marketplace, right? Where you want to compete, okay? General, your management team, who you are going to work for you. Method, what's the company structure, okay? How are you going to do it? So follow this, you can write a business plan, you know? So uh, that's the, if you want to look at, just like uh, Kwong said, uh, military operation is the highest uh, human uh, activity. So apply to business, it's, no doubt about it. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And Amon. Wonderful. Uh, I'm on next. I'm on. Thank you. Since we're in the last of the section, I'm going to try and say everything I want as tersely as possible. Um, and I'm going to start by talking about Febreze, which many of you are familiar with. Um, Procter & Gamble developed Febreze in 1996. Most of you probably never purchased a Febreze until after the 2016 nose blind ad campaign, because they sat on it for 20 years with no, no success in how to bring this product to market, even though they knew there must be a market for it. If you're going to launch into a risky campaign, you need victory. You don't want it to be prolonged. Thinking about this in terms from a business perspective, if you're going to launch something new out there, it needs to land and you need to start profiting from it immediately. Procter & Gamble's huge. They could afford to sit on it for 20 years. But if this was somebody's cottage industry, they would have been destitute before 20 years could have passed in figuring out how are we going to make people want this. The value of an endeavor is in the victory, not in the duration of launching it, of thinking about it, uh, or of protracting the process. There have, Allison mentioned business, and I agree with what Juan said, the, the stakes of warfare and the military are probably much higher than many other human endeavors Though I think the space shuttle launches might be a competing endeavor um, with as high as stakes, if not even higher. Um, you could tell us a figure like Her Harold Ford was a student of the art of war in that he understood those five principles. The Tao, people need to get around. There's a way people need to travel. What is the current environment for it? Well, there's this new thing, but it's a luxury item, but it could be made utilitarian and available to everybody. How can I change the terrain, the earth? I was trying to find Joe's bullet points, but he really 
seem to systematically go about understanding the environment, the atmosphere, the way people thought, and then developing absolute, absolutely perfected command and disciplinary methods for the extractors, systematizing the production, offering better work environments than most other industrial places. Treat your enemies well. If you think of your employees in a unionizing environment as your enemies, well, give them big, broad lights in your factory rooms. Pay them better than the other person does because then they can also buy your product. And while you're at it, get gas stations out there and mechanics and tires and create the environment you want. This was not to sing Henry Ford's praises too much, but it's a modern day example of somebody who utilized so many of Sun Tzu's principles in a practical sense in a modern world. <clears throat> Sun Tzu changed the world of warfare from a brave man's game into a thinking man's game. And in doing so, he did not lose sight that passion was important. James mentioned something about he liked the idea of angry soldiers. That's understandable because you do need passions in soldiers for them to be effective in any way. And those passions extend to, like Juan said, those high stakes of killing, which there are some very interesting stats on. I invite anyone to read Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman's books on killing or on combat, which will tell you how rare killing in warfare actually was for most of human history. It, it's something that runs very counter to most people's instincts. He also mentioned something in the art of, of on killing about the way warfare was understood by different cultures and how, because of its seriousness, it was often moved into a ritualistic space. And he points to the Native American tradition of counting coup, which where it was considered a braver act to go and touch an enemy on a battlefield than it was to actually kill an enemy because you had to show an even greater amount of restraint an either even greater amount of control, an even greater amount of bravery than blindly throwing yourself at something. Being the compassionate army, being seen as the compassionate army is something that is mentioned there as well. When he talks about the World War I German soldiers who had diaries where they said, or World War II German soldiers, excuse me, who were talking to their fathers from World War I, who were given the advice, find a US soldier and surrender to them. They'll treat you better than the Russians will. And it's the easiest and fastest way to get out of the meat grinder that is that warfare. That was a very common refrain. So many of these ideas still see fruition in the modern world in many, many ways, but I love seeing it at its inception point here and imagine how this landed because the real test was, did it work? And as Kwan has pointed out many times to us, the state of Qin took this wholesale and forged the Chinese empire out of warring states. They ended a civil war unlike any we have the ability to imagine. Um, so the proof is in the pudding. It worked. Um, and it worked really well and in a short duration. So thank you all. I'm going to try and shut up now and hear your thoughts. Wonderful, wonderful comments, Amon, as always. Um, so folks, now any comments, any questions, application to any areas is all welcome. And we're going to go on with this till about uh, 10 p.m. Eastern time. And then uh, Jason and uh, you know will need to leave. And then I have some general questions. Um, and uh, you're welcome to stay and uh, continue uh, the discussion. But now anything is fair game, okay? So let's go with uh, 
uh, we're going to start with uh, Shubha, uh, Kwan, Ocean, and James. Shubha. Yeah, maybe uh, I hope this is not too taking too far away from the, the original premise, but I've been kind of struggling with this. Who defines the charter of the war and who's the sponsor of the war? It hasn't been talked about yet in these two chapters. Did I miss it or is it coming up? Sure, great, great question. Uh, Jason, would you like to answer that, Jason? Oh, your or... question is uh, who is in charge of the war? No, who defines the charter? In other words, what is the goal of the war? And who basically says, this is what we're going to do. I know we talk about generals. Those are pretty much the-, the Oh, oh. okay, the, okay. That, that's put this way, okay. During this time, a little bit Chinese his, uh, historical background, right? Um, during that time, it's the changing time. Before it's the feudalism system, they have the Zhou as the emperor of the entire state. They have a lot of uh, feudal, just like a European feudalistic system, right? And then your son become the lord and then have the grand. So they all big family. And during this time, the you can imagine, you know, the, before the neighboring state, the head of neighboring state is just your. Uh, brother, then become your cousin, they become distant cousin, and come further, further away. So, uh, and then have more population, the technology improve, so people start have to fight. So during this time, when this text is written, uh, the head of the state, okay, basics can make decision. What am I going to do? So, the who is powerful, then who set the rule? So just the changing from the gentleman's game before they have some uh, uh, moral law, if you want to call, okay, during the war, okay. So, uh, but during the time, it's all about your power, you know, so. That, so that's what I, sorry, thank you. Along with that, yeah. what defines the victory, what defines the loss is also kind of articulated in any of these? We don't have to define, right? Yeah, if you lose, you lose. So, <laughs> so at this time, there's no boss, no international arbitrator here. So yeah. basics. And I think, well, of course, I, I may be wrong because at that time, other, you know, they have the league, right? Then people will, you know, but, you know, that, that's further history. But basics, Wonderful. power talk. Thank you. Next up is going to be Quan, Ocean, James, and Joe. Quan. Uh, before give, giving before giving my own command, I would like to give a small answer to the question. Okay, uh, there is a kind of spiritual justification for to war, and and the Zhou Dynasty invented the concept for that, and it's called Tianming, the Mandate of Heaven. Okay, so every war has been conducted with the idea that when you have a situation of disorder, of, of chaos, heaven or God, if you want, will grant to a prince the right to restore order and civilization. Of course, it can be debated if the prince is sincere in his desire to, re, to re, re-establish the mandate of heaven, but that conceptual excuse or that conceptual uh, justification for war existed since the Zhou Dynasty, having begun in 1046 BC. And for that, I, I, I go to my own command. What is explained in the art of war can be understood within the framework of a national state, okay? Meaning having a ruler uh, theoretically uh, taking care of the needs of his people. But uh, the, but nowadays, I'm not sure that the national state uh, can be considered, or the, or, the, or, or the leader of the national state can be considered as truly the ruler of a nation. Because uh, as has been said, uh, maybe at the beginning of this discussion, there's the, the notion of the military industrial complex, okay? Uh, is a group of plutocrats a legitimate group of rulers, okay? Because uh, they are not necessarily motivated by the idea of the greatness of the nation or of the well-being of the people or of their epistemological development. 
they are more interested by their wealth and the expansion of their wealth and of their own class. So uh, I would say that what is the Sun Tzu Ping Fa is proposing is within the framework of a nation state having a true ruler, even if he can be quite cruel or relentless, but he's a true ruler in the sense that he incarnates the idea of the nation, of his people, and he has a certain preoccupation for the well-being of his people and not of what we have nowadays, at least in the West, which is a group of uh, a plutocratic organization that certain of my friends would call a criminal organization. And I stop here. Thank you. Next up is Jason. Jason, go ahead. Is, uh, uh, is that uh, Sapu's uh, it's question on the, how, who defined the winner? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Next week, I think the Sun Tzu has a better answer on, on you. Okay. About how, what, what do you kind of talk about? What do you mean winning? Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Ocean. Ocean, go ahead. Now you can bring okay. up anything that you want now. Oh, sure, sure. A couple of people. Um, you know, there is a great saying that you can't fight with an empty belly. And um, a couple of mentioned people mentioned, it was Quan maybe, uh, mentioned about uh, the, 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 the Japanese uh, samurai um, depicted by the uh, famous uh, movie director, Mr. Kurosawa. And um, there are a couple of, um, you know, uh, renowned uh, warlords in around 1500 and 600, but they, unanimously, the common denominator is before they started the war campaign, they made sure that their people are well fed um, th through trade and the great farming system. So they clearly understood the importance of the economy. So this book is, talks about war is mathematics, calculation, and the war is economy, not just about the muscle, muscle strength. So, you know, people, some people understood. And uh, my question for everybody though, I, I wanna welcome everybody's intelligent uh, speculation is that, yeah, it, it's, it's a, reading this book is a real, gives you a leverage against people who are not familiar with this kind of um, uh, strategies. But uh, if two warlords or two nations, uh, two war generals are uh, a master of this kind of a book, then which 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 will win you know if two people are fighting two people who are master of art of war which you think will make the difference that's the question i would like to uh, give to everybody i want to welcome everybody thank you thank you thank you ocean uh, so folks uh, you're welcome to answer this question at, at some point or raise anything else make your any comments that you want uh, next up is going to be james yeah, I, I first wanted to finish my comment on the Vietnam War because uh, uh, it seems to me that uh, the idea of protraction, which was a, t a word in the text, uh, that was the uh, that was actually the propaganda when the Vietnam War sort of like became long war when it was promised that it was not going to be uh, very important or or you know. Uh, what a kind of police action, I think, is what it was originally called, and then it became a pretty, pretty much full scale war. And uh, so then they started using the word protracted. So it means, you know, like extended in time. So, and uh, it extended, of course, over a very long time. And uh, uh, the, but uh, so it was the uh, the idea of uh, any time you're going to spend a long time in a war, you're probably not going to win. You're going to have a stalemate, most likely, and uh, it's not going to be a very good war for your side. Um, and then the, uh, and then on, uh, I guess on uh, uh, Ocean's question, uh, it depends on your overall resources, you know, the overall power balance, and uh, uh, and 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 reading Sun Tzu, of course, could be very important, but it, it, that's not to say that all leaders are equal. So you could have one leader that read Sun Tzu over here and another one that read Sun Tzu on the other side. And maybe he read another book that had, you know, uh, better commentary on uh, how to win a war along, along with Sun Tzu. So uh, like Klausowitz, for example, I know they read both in the US Army. So there you go. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, let's see. Uh, Amon is next. Amon, go ahead. 
I just wanted to jump in because I'm going to be jumping off in two seconds um, with a spoiler alert for the question both uh, Ocean Ask and uh, Evanique addressed. Who would win with two people? It would be the person defending who is further from home. That is actually the answer Sun Tzu will give you. And the rationale is to be announced in later chapters. But those things count too. It's not just about, it is not just about the psychology and the preparation. It's also the circumstance. Circumstance is a big factor to consider in warfare. I really enjoyed this. I'm sorry I had to do it from the road to start the evening, but I thank you all. And I look forward to hearing everyone's thoughts next week when we launch into chapter th or book three. And it's really good to see some of these faces again who I haven't seen for a while, including yours, Shrikant. So thank you. It's nice to see you and you all have a great evening. Same, Say same, again. same. Yeah, year. I hope you come back for uh, 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 Analex. So <laughs> I, I, I don't know about Analex. I love this art of war. <laughs> it's it's well, Analex is, is, is well. I I have to admit it's a little bit boring, but it's very important because uh, you are to understand the other culture. Doesn't matter you like it or you hate it. You need to know it. Just like it is the bitter medicine. Just like if you don't read Bible, don't talk about Western culture. <laughs> yeah. Yes, no, I absolutely, I, I, I agree, agree with that completely. Uh, and thank you, thank you, uh, Jason. Uh, any any closing comment, Jason? Uh, no, I already said enough and uh, this, uh, uh, great, we keep the good pace and thank you for everyone's cooperation and uh, sorry for sometimes I have to, we have to interrupt some of your comment. I know because I've been a uh, host in, uh, in the Asian philosophy. Whenever we talk about art of war, it's a lot of discussion outside of the text. Okay, so uh, it's un unavoidable. And uh, thank you, Shrinkan, to provide additional section so people can thank you. talk. Yeah. So yes. join us uh, next week. And sometimes, you know, our text will be a little bit longer. So we may not, we may need to a little bit rush. And today we are more relaxed. And next week will be fine, same as this week. And then uh, thank you. And I hope to see you next week. Yeah. Wonderful. So folks, now I want to broaden the discussion, but uh, anybody who has comments to wrap up this, uh, we'll do that. And then I have a more general question about what we are learning from all these Chinese works how does it compare to what we've learned from the Indian works? How does it compare to what we've learned from uh, the Bible, you know, Gospel of John? So I want to do this comparison between these three, which is a very large. So if you could make any comments that you have about Art of War Worry uh, in brief, we'll wrap it up and then we will go to a much larger question. So it's going to be uh, Kwan followed by Kevin. So folks, uh, Kwan and Kevin, we always love your comments, so please take your time. Go ahead. Uh, I would like to answer to the question of by Ocean because um, I am very happy that Amon mentioned the factor of circumstances because circumstances are important, of course. But I would like to offer a perspective from universal history, meaning that I think that there is an ascending uh, journey of universal history, meaning that ultimately the state or the group of states that will ultimately win is the state or the group of state that will benefit the most the people under its role, okay, meaning offering what the Chinese, since we are, we are discussing of Chinese classic, I would use Chinese lexicon, meaning the state capable to fulfill the most the mandate of heaven, okay, and the, what is the mandate of heaven? The mandate of heaven is to secure food, to secure peace and order, and to secure education for the people. So education is not only the ordinary training in order to get a trade, but education is also the epistemological growth to beauty, goodness, and truth. So circumstances, perfectly right. Psychological preparation, perfectly right.
the food preparation, weapon preparations, I would say what is possible for human intellect and organization to produce, that's for sure, okay? But at the basis, funda fundamentally, speak, fundamentally speaking, the state or the group of state that will gain the final victory in the eye of history is the state or the group of state that will be capable to bring most of its population to the ultimate achievement, meaning civilization, going to beauty, goodness, and truth. And it goes a little bit also, I just want to take 30 seconds, what, what I would call the, the inner warfare and the outer warfare, okay? Because uh, you were speaking of comparing the Indian to Chinese Western matrices. Uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, you have a situation of war, of external war, but the true war was in the heart of Arjuna, okay? So I think that the Bhagavad Gita is really superb for that. And that's what I mean by universal history. It's the uplifting of the heart, the mind, and the soul of human beings that would be uh, rewarded by history as being the state or the group of state being the ruler of, uh, at the head of universal peace. And I finished. Thank you. Thank you, Kwan. Uh, next up is uh, Kevin, followed by Laura. Kevin, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Sanka. Thank you, everyone else. Um, I would pose a question. Is the world a part of human nature? I personally, I consider the world a disease. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's just not, not benefit for, for current generation and, and, and future. So, um, and I would prefer you launch the war. What's common interest between the two parts almost? And by this book, the world of art, I can see there's no war at all. Especially next chapter, they're going to see how to avoid the war. Before a war goes to a different state, that's the last. It's try to pull it back, 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 eventually, you know, fine. And uh, uh, this book, if you consider this book's tools, considering nuclear technology the tools too how do we use it that's important not in winner or loser and by the way when we read this classical book you know, uh, from Tao Te Ching and uh, uh, analogs and the art of war they all use dialectical thinking they talk about war actually there's no war and personally, I would consider I'm myself the victim of the war in the United States. How if inflation impact to my daily life? I pay more for grocery and tax for the, uh, for the gas. So that's my opinion, thank you. Wonderful, so we'll do uh, two quick comments and then we will go ahead on looking at um, you know, the comparison between the Chinese works we are studying, the Indian works we are studying, uh, our study of Bible. And I'm also going to incorporate Kwan's observation about outer and inner uh, into that. So we'll discuss. So uh, Laura, go ahead. Please, if you could keep it brief, go ahead. No? Okay. Uh, Joe, go ahead. I'll be really brief. Um... I just want to make one quick comment because everything that has needed to be said has been said pretty much. But um, I forget who had asked the question is who defines the idea of success in a war? And I think that that's a very profound question because it really gets to the heart of why you're doing it in the first place is, are you doing it to conquer? Or are you doing it for security? And by asking that question, and I think Sun Tzu is posing that to us in a way, like don't do this if it's for, I think, you know, greed purposes, just to conquer. You'll overexhaust your resources and the costs will not be worth it. If you're doing it 
as a form of defense, then it's part of what you have to do as a king or a prince. You have to make these decisions. But asking that question is critical because I think many times that princes don't necessarily look at they may do a calculation or even people today and not necessarily consider and define what success is really, really is. And um, I think that that's just something that is worth thinking about and mentioning. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. 